Tucked away in the warm waters of the Caribbean, Grenada is a small, beautiful island known for its picturesque coastlands, historic forts, and rich culture. It's been nicknamed the Isle of Spice for its abundance of cinnamon, nutmeg, and ginger, and is even home to world-class cocoa beans. It sounds like the kind of place you'd never want to leave. But in 1983, quite the opposite was true. Grenada, despite being a member of the British Commonwealth, was suddenly subject to a full-scale invasion by a combination of the United States military and a peacekeeping coalition made up of several other Caribbean nations. It's not a conflict that many people these days are well informed of if they've heard of it at all. So today we're going to explore why this invasion happened in the first place, how it was planned and carried out, and the many controversies that surround it to this day. Though the invasion itself began in 1983, the story as always begins much earlier. First, let's run through a quick recap of how Grenada became an independent nation. Before the arrival of those pesky Europeans, Grenada was inhabited by people that likely had migrated from South America perhaps as long ago as 3500 BC. This included the Arawak and Saboni peoples. However, sometime around 1000 AD, Grenada was reached by the Carib during their Caribbean expansion, during which time they became the dominant majority on the island after warring with the original inhabitants. Columbus and his men were the first Europeans to report seeing Grenada, though they never actually attempted to land there. Instead, they just sailed past it, with Columbus declaring it Spanish property and naming it La Concepcion. This later changed to Mayo, and sometime later to Grenada, a slightly different spelling from today's version, but that name changed over time to how we spell it today. The English were the first Europeans to attempt to settle on the islands, but the local Carib put a quick stop to that with violent massacres. Several unsuccessful attempts to settle took place throughout the 1600s until France became the first to set up a permanent colony in 1649. They were able to do this by signing a treaty with a local Carib chief, but as you probably expected, hostilities broke out just a few weeks later, giving France the perfect opportunity to completely take over the entire island. Grenada became quite the cash cow under France, pumping out huge amounts of spices that were were introduced to the island's warm climate, spices which were, of course, being harvested by African slaves brought across the Atlantic. Slave labor continued to be the driving force behind Grenada's economy, even as the island was ceded to the British in the late 1700s. Throughout the years, slowly but surely, Grenada was given more and more power to govern itself by the British Empire. Firstly, and most importantly, the 1800s saw the banning of the slave trade and the emancipation of all slaves. Then a while later, the island was granted the status of crown colony eventually leading to a slight governmental change that allowed Grenadians to vote for five of the 15 members of the Legislative Council. In the 1960s, Grenada was given full autonomy over its own affairs when the Federation of the West Indies collapsed, and finally in 1974, after hundreds of years of being a colony under foreign rule, Grenada was granted its full independence and became a member of the British Commonwealth. At this point, though, just as the nation was being reborn, trouble was already brewing. When Grenada held their first independent elections, Sir Eric Gare head of the right-wing Grenada United Labour Party, became the country's first prime minister. However, a lot of people, especially parties opposing Gary, didn't see this election as legitimate. Speaking out against Prime Minister Gary wasn't exactly the best idea, though, because a group known as the Mongoose Gang violently silenced any opposition. They basically acted as Gary's personal secret police, and they were armed to the teeth. Using the Mongoose Gang, Gary's rule over the island grew more and more authoritarian. Another concern was that he was receiving aid from Chile's authoritarian leader, Augusto Pinochet, a man who, if you're not aware, was not exactly known for his good deeds as a president. In fact, he was actually a dictator who tortured and executed anyone he didn't like, but let's go back to Grenada. To lash out at the current regime's growing power, a new group emerged in the newly independent nation and began fighting back against the Mongoose Gang. This was the New Jewel Movement, or NJM for short, a Marxist-Leninist group led by a man named Maurice Bishop. The NJM rioted and protested against Gary's rule, leading to a day known as Bloody Monday, where a mass demonstration was attacked by a pro-Gary crowd who pelted the protesters with rocks. Security forces had to be deployed, and tear gas was used to quell the chaos, but the violence only escalated in other parts of the capital, and Bishop's father was shot dead while returning to the hotel where the family was staying. Rumor has it that it was specifically the Mongoose Gang who had been responsible for the murder, further motivating Bishop in his quest against Gary. In 1976, Bishop 
leadership in NJM campaigned to be Prime Minister, but lost the election to none other than Sir Eric Gehry, who was voted into office for a second term. Lots of people, especially the New Jewel movement, opposed the election results and claimed that Gehry had only won thanks to intimidation by a secret police. After the election results were confirmed, the New Jewel movement started having serious, vicious street fights with the Mongoose gang using their own military wing that they called the National Liberation Army. These fights went on for a few years until the NJM really ramped things up to a whole other level. In 1979, Sir Eric Gehry set off on a diplomatic trip to speak with the UN in New York. While he was away, the New Drill movement set into motion a coup d'etat that they'd been planning for months. Radio stations, police barracks, and government buildings were taken over by the National Liberation Army, leading to the deaths of a soldier and a policeman. Bishop quickly declared himself Granada's new prime minister and immediately suspended the constitution to get control over the island. Of course, this didn't sit well with anybody, but he reassured everyone over the radio that democratic freedoms would soon be returned once order had been restored. The People's Revolutionary Government was now in charge, and Granada was never going to be the same. So what was life like in Granada after the revolution? Well, for starters, democratic freedoms such as free voting were never returned, contrary to what Bishop had promised. Every political party other than the New Jewel movement was strictly forbidden, as Granada was now a one-party communist nation. However, interestingly enough, the country remained in the British Commonwealth, so as weird as it sounds, Granada now had a Marxist-Leninist government, but was still using currency depicting Queen Elizabeth II. But by several metrics, life on Granada actually improved during this time. When he took control, Bishop declared, We are a small country, we are a poor country, with a population of largely African descent. We are a part of the exploited third world, and we definitely have a stake in seeking the creation of a new international economic order. And true to his word, the New Jewel movement got to work restructuring life in Granada. Paid maternity leave, equal pay, and free medical consultations were all announced. Unemployment dropped to 14%, down from nearly 50 The number of doctors increased, infant mortality rate decreased, and the literacy rate went up. The World Bank even noted that Granada was one of the only Western nations to experience significant GDP growth per capita in 1981. But all of this progress came with a few drawbacks. First of all, when Bishop first took power in 1979, he began developing closer ties with Cuba and the Soviet Union, causing all economic aid from the United States and the UK to essentially disappear overnight, and many other countries started severing diplomatic ties as well. Under the grip of the New Jewel movement, Granada was becoming more and more isolated on the international stage, and to top it all off, civil unrest was simmering from the takeover. Armed guards walked the streets, confiscating and searching belongings for pornography or illicit drugs, and tourism was rapidly declining. However, the biggest problem that Bishop's new government faced was the internal conflict that it created in Granada. You see, a one-party system is cool and all when you're the one that's actually in charge, but a lot of other people despised Bishop's position of high power. At one point, a bomb exploded in a meeting that Bishop was supposed to attend, but it cancelled at the last minute. The explosion had killed three and wounded a further 25, and Bishop was quick to accuse the CIA and American imperialism of being behind the failed assassination plot, but US President Carter claimed he was opposed to such operations at the time. Other than the CIA, there were a few possible suspects, such as drug lords, that were now being hunted down by the new regime, but we'll never really know for sure. The person with the most resentment towards Bishop was a man named Bernard Goard, the deputy prime minister. Eventually, Goard tried to convince Bishop to split the prime minister's power with him, so that the two of them would have an equal say in government matters, but Bishop refused. After his refusal, Coard placed Bishop under house arrest and initiated a coup d'etat, taking control of the government using the People's Revolutionary Army and declaring himself Granada's new Prime Minister in October of 1983. However, despite having no shortage of enemies within the government, Bishop had actually been pretty popular with Granada's population for all of the progress that he'd brought in the last few years, and crowds started gathering outside his house and across the country, demanding that Coard release him. During one of these protests, Bishop was somehow freed by the crowd and fled to Fort Rupert, where a loyal part of the army was waiting for him. Just a few minutes after arriving at the fort, another unit of the People's Revolutionary Army arrived, this one looking to take Bishop back into custody. A huge firefight ensued between the armies and dozens of civilians, and in the aftermath, Bishop was shot, just like his father had been a decade earlier. Along with Bishop, seven other politicians were executed, leaving a gaping hole in the leadership of the nation. The People's Revolutionary government lasted four years, and the country 
was now headed right back into violence. Of course, with Bishop now dead, someone swooped right in to take a spot. This was General Hudson Austin, and after forcing Deputy Coard out of the picture, he created the Revolutionary Military Council with himself as chairman. Faced with an eruption of riots and protests all over Granada, the council's first act was to announce a drastic measure to restore order, a four-day total curfew. No one would be allowed outside of their home, and anyone found on the streets would be executed without trial. Governor General Paul Schoon, who had held his position for five years now, survived the new government burden but he was placed under house arrest by the new military council. However, just before he was taken captive, he sent messages through secret diplomatic channels to the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States asking for international military intervention. This call for help was quickly passed along to the United States, and an action plan was immediately approved by U.S. President Ronald Reagan. So let's set the record straight here. Ronald Reagan agreed to intervene in Grenada with the other Caribbean states, but this was far from the first time Grenada had caught his attention. In fact, Reagan's eyes have been fixed on the island for years now. First of all, Grenada was under the rule of a Marxist dictator, and the United States was well known for doing their part in toppling communist governments, especially in Central and South America. On top of this, Grenada had been growing very close to Cuba and the Soviet Union, and although Bishop asserted that it was merely an economic friendship, Reagan was concerned that the Soviets were going to use Grenada to spread their sphere of influence in the Caribbean. One reason for his concern was the Point Salines International Airport, which was currently under construction and featured a runway with a length of 9,000 feet, or about 2,700 meters. The American government believed that these specifications were chosen for the runway so that it could accommodate large Soviet transport aircraft such as the AN-22 or the newer AN-124. But Bishop assured them that this was purely for larger civilian aircraft full of tourists that couldn't land on the country's other, much shorter runway. Regardless, at one point, Reagan had sent Congressman Roy Dellums to the airport to inspect it for himself, and Dellums reported, Based on my personal observations, discussion, and analysis, it is my conclusion that this project is specifically now and has always been for the purpose of economic development and is not for military use. It is my thought that it is absurd, patronizing, and totally unwarranted for the United States government to charge that this airport poses a military threat to the United States' national security. But despite this, Reagan continued to cite intelligence reports that the Soviet Union had growing interest on the islands and that the massive fuel storage tanks near the runway had no civilian purpose. It was still his firm belief that the USSR intended to turn Grenada's airport into a forward military airbase, a belief shared by plenty of other American politicians. Perhaps the biggest concern, though, were the American citizens stuck on Grenada under the new military council's curfew. An estimated 600 American medical students were studying at the island's universities, and there were several tourists unable to leave. The Iran hostage crisis had only just concluded a couple of years before this, and there were fears of a repeat scenario in Grenada. With all of this in mind, the United States officially joined the invading forces. Alongside the United States was a coalition force known as the Caribbean Peace Force or CPF, with members from seven nations, Barbados, Jamaica, Dominica, Antigua, Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Between the seven Caribbean nations, the CPF mustered a force of 353 troops. The United States showed up to the party with 7,300 men, four tanks, an aircraft carrier, dozens of fighter jets, and several warships of various types. The bulk of the invading forces gathered in Barbados, set to move in on October 25, 1983, under codename Operation Urgent fury. Beginning two days before the invasion, several reconnaissance missions were carried out to gather better intelligence about Grenada's defenses and geography. On October the 23rd, Navy SEALs from SEAL Team 6 were dropped from helicopters near the coast with the intent of mapping out the Point Salines airport. However, from one of the helicopter drops, four SEALs were dropped in the wrong place and were never heard from again. It was assumed that they were lost at sea while trying to make it to the coast, but some locals claimed to have seen men in wetsuits coming out of the ocean and later saw their bodies being dumped back where they came from. So while we'll never know for sure, it's possible uh, they were captured and executed. Another team of SEALs made their way towards Grenada on small boats, but their boats flooded when they had to take evasive maneuvers away from a patrol boat, and the mission was called off. The next day, the weather was too harsh for any airdrops, so any further reconnaissance missions were cancelled, and the invading forces were going to have to make do without any updated intelligence. On the first day of the invasion, several C-130 
1830s took off from Georgia before dawn, carrying army rangers with the plan of landing in the Point Salines airport and taking it over. However, partway through the flight, it was discovered that the runways at the airport were blocked by construction equipment, so the men prepared for a parachute drop. At around 5 a.m., rangers began dropping into the airport in the face of moderate anti-aircraft fire defending the runway. Using anti-tank weapons and with the help of gunships overhead, they were able to eliminate the armored vehicles and other threats on the runway, clearing it within five hours, allowing more transport planes to land and begin unloading more men, supplies, and vehicles. Men from the Caribbean Peace Force arrived and began setting up perimeter defenses, and jeeps were unloaded for forward operations. Then the men fanned out, sweeping the airport and rounding up any survivors. A hundred Cuban construction personnel were found, and a surrender was negotiated without a fight. Just as the airport had been completely secured, the Grenadian army counterattacked. Multiple BTR-60s arrived and began firing at the transport planes, but they were quickly taken out of commission with anti-tank weapons. With that out of the way, jeeps began heading toward the True Blue campus with the aim of safely evacuating the American students there. On the way, one of the jeeps took a wrong turn and was ambushed, resulting in the deaths of all four inside, but the rest of the jeeps made it to the campus. However, this campus only had 140 of the students. It turns out that reconnaissance had failed to report that the students were actually housed on two separate campuses, so they were going to have to recover the others later. So now onto the other objectives of the first day. First up was the Pearls Airport, a smaller airport on the other side of the island. Navy SEALs from SEAL Team 4 had approached the coastline near Pearls Airport the night before and found it mostly undefended, but stormy weather forced them to turn around. However, their reports of the defenses made it a cakewalk for the Marines the next day, who landed with a few helicopters and quickly overtook any resistance. The only real danger the Pearls Airport was a mounted DSHK heavy machine gun, but an attack helicopter destroyed it within seconds. Pearls Airport was completely captured by 6 a.m. Another mission by Navy SEALs took place early in the morning when they were deployed to a radio station with the intent of using it for psychological operations. They found it undefended, captured it quickly, and destroyed all equipment to prevent the Grenadian Army from using it. However, while they were at the radio station, they were attacked by several armored vehicles, and because the SEALs were only lightly armored and lacked any anti-tank weapons, they were forced to run. They cut open a fence and ran through the rocky coast into the ocean while under fire. After hiding from patrols by staying low in the water near the coastline, they swam out into the ocean and were picked up by friendly helicopters after a reconnaissance plane spotted them. Now everything we just went over, from both airports to the radio station, I went down in the early morning, with objectives being completed and areas being secured for the most part by the early afternoon. By 5 p.m., every team was ready to commence with the final objectives for day one, rescuing Governor General Schoon, the man who had sent the request for foreign intervention, as well as raiding Fort Rupert and Richmond Hill Prison, where it was believed the leaders of the military council and the revolutionary government would be found. Delta Force units in several helicopters made their way to Richmond Hill Prison, but they lacked crucial intelligence about it. When they arrived, they found the hills leading up to it were steep, with no clear space for a helicopter to land, and while the helicopters looked for a landing site, they came under fire from multiple anti-aircraft guns that had been mounted along the prison walls. One helicopter was hit and crash-landed, forcing another to hover down low and protect the downed passengers. Pilots had been killed, and backup was called to evacuate the troops. Meanwhile, at Fort Rupert, Delta Force had a much better time, where they succeeded successfully landed, eliminated resistance, and captured several leaders from the People's Revolutionary Government. The final mission for the first day was to rescue Governor General Schoon, who was being held in his mansion on the southwestern edge of the island. Currently, several Navy SEALs were also at his mansion, as they'd snuck in that morning, but ended up being besieged by heavy vehicles and had been stuck inside all day. Attempts to rescue the SEALs and Governor Schoon with air support had been unsuccessful, but they were finally saved at 8 p.m. when 250 Marines and four tanks arrived on the scene. They quickly knocked out Grenadier Army vehicles, scattered any remaining resistance, and evacuated the governor, his family, and the Navy SEALs. Now that the main objectives of the first day had been completed, it was time to rescue the remaining American students at the second campus. This campus was called Grand Ants, and the police there put up some light resistance to the incoming army rangers before fleeing, and the campus was quickly secured by day two. However, as far as rescues go, this one was as sloppy as they get. One helicopter crashed after its blade hit a palm tree, and after picking up the remaining students, everyone learned that there was a third group of Americans at a third location. Then, after everybody left, a squad 
of 11 rangers was accidentally left behind and they had to take an inflatable raft out to sea to get picked up. The only other action seen on the second day was a counterattack by Cuban militants who ambushed several American patrols. The Americans pushed them back to their bases and fired artillery at them until they surrendered, after which they seized the sizable weapons cash left behind. Later that night, a Cuban armored vehicle was destroyed and the remaining Americans were located. By this point, Grenadian and Cuban resistance was almost entirely squashed, and groups of Marines were moving from city to city, rounding up any remaining soldiers who mostly surrendered without a fight. The final military action of the invasion took place on November the 1st on a small island called Caracal, located a few miles from Granada. A combined amphibious and helicopter marine landing stormed across the island, and the 19 Grenadian stationed there surrendered without a fight. This was also one of the first deployments of the new A-10 Warthog, which was providing air cover over Caracal, but of course didn't fire weapons at all because the marines on the grounds met no resistance. With the capture of Caracal, Granada was completely occupied by the United States and the Caribbean Peace Force, and the occupiers now to figure out what to do next. After order had been restored to the island, the occupying forces got to work bringing Granada back to its former freedoms. Governor Schoon was placed as interim head of state for a year until free elections were held once again. In December 1984, the Granada National Party won the election and a new prime minister was placed in office, this time chosen by the people. The occupying forces stuck around for about a year to keep the island secure, after which they left, leaving Granada a free and democratic nation. Sounds like a great success story, right? Well, as you might expect, there was a whole lot of controversy surrounding the invasion and a lot of accusation thrown in every direction. For starters, let's cover the combat casualties. From the US, 19 men were killed, just over 100 were wounded, and the Caribbean Peace Force didn't lose any men. Granada suffered 45 deaths, Cuba 24, and between the two countries, nearly a thousand have been wounded or captured. Sadly, 24 civilians became unintentional victims of the invasion. 18 of them when a mental hospital was accidentally targeted during an airstrike. In terms of the US lost nine helicopters, Cuba and Granada had several armored vehicles destroyed or immobilized, and a secret Soviet weapons cache had been recovered containing thousands of rifles, anti-tank weapons, 12 armored vehicles, and nearly 6 million rounds of ammunition. The cache had some immediately jumping to point out that Reagan had been correct about the Soviet Union's influence in Granada, and in fact two Soviet military advisors on the island were wounded in the fighting, but the international community was far far less convinced of the invasion's legitimacy. The United Nations outright accused the United States of violating international law, stating that Granada had imposed a security threat to the United States or any other Caribbean nation, and therefore no one had any right to act militarily. The UN voted a staggering 108 to 9 to condemn the invasion, though when asked, Ronald Reagan said that this vote didn't upset his breakfast at all. The Soviet Union, of course, was livid. They said that the US was returning to barbarism and that no small country would ever feel safe Again. The UK wasn't too pleased either, especially considering that Granada was still a part of the British Commonwealth, and afterward Reagan personally phoned Margaret Thatcher to apologize for not keeping her informed ahead of the invasion. Interestingly, the United States public was rather supportive of the war, which is rather surprising considering the fierce anti-war protests across the country throughout the Vietnam War just a decade earlier, but polls showed that a large percentage of Americans were pleased with how the government had acted, how efficiently the military had done its job, and that the intervention had been justified. The students themselves were also grateful to be rescued, though a few of them stated that they never felt like they were in any real danger in the first place. But while the American public saw the invasion as a success, the American military saw the whole operation as a series of blunders and miscommunication. And truthfully, so many things did go wrong. Poor reconnaissance ahead of time had failed to locate the anti-air defenses that took down a helicopter near the prison. Miscommunication had led to the rangers on the ground not knowing that the American students were located on more than one campus, and the airstrike on a mental hospital was nothing short of catastrophic. Further, the maps of the islands that the troops were given were actually tourist maps of the island, meaning that the men had to hand-draw grid lines in order to understand their positions and orders. And because of the slight inaccuracies and confusion between these maps, at least one American was killed by friendly fire from a naval bombardment. After the invasion was over, the military sought to fix these issues by implementing the Goldwater Nichols Act, a plan to improve communication between different branches and rework the command structure of the entire military. At the end of the day, though, one could argue that the most important opinion on the invasion is that of the Grenadians themselves. Today, the majority of Grenadians view the invasion in a good light, with most agreeing that it brought democracy back to the island after it was taken away in a Marxist coup. Thanksgiving Day is celebrated on October the 25th to commemorate the liberation. And 
most people believe that the country has gotten back on its own two feet and improved tremendously since. There are others, however, that believe to this day that the invasion of Granada was nothing more than a Cold War showdown and that their islands became a battlefield just so the United States could flip off the Soviet Union. It doesn't help that there's a bit of a mystery surrounding the events as well, mostly concerning the body of Maurice Bishop. You see, after Bishop was killed, his body was disposed of, but it was never located, even after General Austin was brought to trial for his actions in the military council leading up to the invasion. There are some conspiracies that US soldiers took the bodies away, or that they even hid evidence. This is pretty unlikely, as it was probably dumped by Austin and his cronies during the military takeover. So what do you think? Was the invasion a justified use of force to save American students, restore democracy, and respond to a call for help? Or did the United States use their dominant military just to flax on the Soviet Union in a bit of a classic Cold War battle?